And now we're just going to go into develop. So I'm going to take one of these shots and hit develop. Now, when we're in develop, it's very much like camera raw. It's very much like camera raw. Anyone that's used that before, the bridge and Photoshop plugin, it's, it's very, very good. Um, and Lightroom follows a very similar set of adjustments down along here. Anyone that's, that's used that before will be very familiar with this, but not to worry if you haven't, because as I say, this is just a walkthrough for complete beginners. Um, so on the left hand side you have a navigator if we were for instance if we were zoomed uh, right in to our image like this the navigator allows us to uh, pull that little box around and look at specific bits of the image that we want to change or check and then we can just click on the image to zoom back out you've got presets lightroom presets are quite handy and um, particularly if you if you set up your own your, that's your particular style and um, but again these are the default ones that we're looking at here you have black and white presets you have uh, color effects presets all of those and you can also download additional ones as well um, so they can be really handy and um, with no snapshots yet and history that's just gonna it's you'll see here history keeps a look on everything that we've done all right so that's all our imports and brush strokes and all those kind of things. And um, collections, we've got those as well. We spoke about those before. And so here's our photograph. We're able to come over here on the right hand side. As I say, it usually works from left to right. So we've got our, our presets and things here, the image itself here. And then on here, we have a couple of different things. So the histogram, there it is again. You'll see as I hover over the histogram, little bits of it highlight. So what that means is that these are your blacks. It tells you below, look, these are your blacks. These are your shadows. These, uh, well, it says exposure, but that's sort of your mid grays. Um, those are your highlights and those are your whites. And um, as I go through, if I was, for instance, here, look, exposure is the first slider. If I was to push this exposure slider all the way to the right, You'll see it gets brighter and brighter, and if you look at the histogram up at the top, all of the information is shifting towards white until I get up to plus five, and look, that's pretty much all at, at the white end there. And also, if I hover over the top of this, okay, this will show me the areas of my photograph that are overexposed. These are the areas that are pure white and you really, really want to avoid pure whites anywhere you can because it just doesn't print on it. It's just the, the paper, so you want to avoid that. Um, and then I'm going to do the opposite as well. Look, I'm going to take the exposure slider all the way down. There's us back at, oh, by the way, if I just double click on any of these sliders, look, double click, it's back to zero. It's back to where we started. So it's a good way of resetting one of the sliders if you don't like a particular adjustment. And then I'm going to do the opposite here. Watch the histogram at the top. I'm going to slide all the way to the left. And you'll see, look, all the, all the information in the photograph is huddled over here towards the dark end. And if I hover over here, it shows me all the areas that are pure black. Um, in this case, it's just the, the wee bits of the, the pier or the, the key underneath. Um, but yeah, double click and we're back to, back to normal. So exposure contrast underneath and um, i mean fairly self-explanatory but over to the right you see it gets a very contrasty it makes the the darks darker and the the lights lighter it adds more contrast to your image and um, as far as the histogram goes you'll see that it spreads out your color information do you see that it spreads it out so it pushes more of the color information towards the whites and more of the color information towards the blacks, so it's creating more contrast. And if I take it the opposite way, less contrasty, you'll see that everything, the photo looks a bit grayer, a bit flatter, there's less kind of sharp kind of highlights or, or shadows. And most of your histogram is just huddled in here around the middle gray or high gray kind of area. And double click back to there. You've also got temperature and tint. Now, temperature, um, the color temperature that you've shot it at, it'll, it'll read that off the camera, but in general, you can warm it up 
by pushing this slider to the right and cool it off by pushing it to the left. Um, with all of these adjustments today, um, I'm going to show you not so much how you know I would necessarily adjust them. Uh, we'll do individual adjustments as we go through, but I want to show you all of the extremes as we go through because I appreciate that people will be looking at this for, for the first time. So we've got really cool photos there and really warm photos there. You've also got tint, as I say, double click to reset that. You've got tint, you can either add a green or magenta like that. And generally, it's a bit of a, a balancing act between those two. Okay, so what else do we have here? We've got control of our highlights, our shadows, our whites, and our blacks. So those are individual parameters that are really good to set. Um, they allow us to just get much more individual control. So say for instance, I, I look at my exposure. I mean, I don't know if I want that particularly brighter or darker than it was shot. I mean, maybe a bit darker actually. We'll take half a stop off it. Contrast, I'm pretty happy with it, but just for the sake of this, we'll, we'll stick a, a plus five contrast or something like that. Um, now, watch what happens when I adjust highlights. The whole image stays the same, but the clouds are changing there. So I can adjust that. So I could take down, for instance, I could take down the highlights and the clouds, make them look a bit moodier, or if you wanted to lift it, whatever, whatever you were particularly trying to do. The shadows, if I bring them down, everything gets darker, you'll see there. And if I bring them up, they come up again a bit more towards the mid-gray up in the histogram. So there, you'll see the difference that makes there. So highlights and shadows, we'll take a bit off the highlights, um, maybe nudge the shadows up a little bit. And then whites, now this is a good trick with, with whites. You'll see that I can move them up or down same with blacks, right, up or down. But if I hold Alt while I'm doing that, if I hold Alt and click it, what you'll see is as I drag the whites up, it starts to show me the areas that are, that are gonna be clipped, the areas that are overexposed, that are white, and that I want to avoid. So I can take this down until I have no white spots left. And there we go, we've, we've, got, we've set the white point, that's called setting the white point. You've got the blacks, they work exactly the same. Uh, you know, there's up and down. But if I hold Alt while I'm doing that, it'll start to show me, look, the bits that are pure black. So if I take the blacks right down, you'll see here um, that the whole pier is now just pure black, which we don't want either. We don't, we don't want pure black in general. We, we kind of try to stay just slightly above. It doesn't matter one or two wee touches, but you certainly don't want it that amount of pure black on your on your final print. Okay, so a lot of just a wee touch of black in there. Okay, so we've got our we've set our adjustments here. We've got it for exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks so far. Now clarity, clarity is it's sort of like contrast, but it, it's about the, the edges of your edges of your image, basically. If you have a lot of clarity, then you tend to get what look like nearly black outlines around it. It, it really crisps up all of your outlines. Um, it can be good for some things, but I tend to avoid it a wee bit because it, it gives you this HDR look, which, which I'm not too, not too fussed in. Uh, the high dynamic range look. Um, if you take it all the way down, you'll see your photo looks soft and fuzzy, sort of hazy. Again, I wouldn't do that. Um, but maybe a wee touch, just a wee boost, say plus four or five, and it'll just crisp up some of the, the edges there, but you can leave that where it is if you like. Um, now, vibrance and saturation. Vibrance and saturation are your color adjustments. If I take saturation, for instance, and pull it all the way to the left, it desaturates the color, takes the color out, and makes it a black and white image, makes it a, a gray image. Um, and if I put that up, you'll see, it saturates the color, so it soaks the color, and it makes it just brighter and brighter, richer and richer, until you can overdo that. So um, most of the adjustments that you'll make um, will be 
quite subtle. They, you'll rarely add a, a plus 100 or a minus 100 on, on anything, you know. Um, if, if you do your kind of, I suppose you're in the rescue job, you know, you want to maybe look at the, the last tutorial and take a better photograph in the, in the first instance so that you know that it's sort of well exposed and decently balanced already before you, you get to this stage. Um, now vibrance of colour, vibrance is, is pretty good as well. It's similar to saturation, look you, you take that out and it becomes sort of grayscale. You put that up and it becomes very bright. Um, vibrance is a bit more selective on the colours that it boosts but yeah, it's you'll see there, look there's, like there's plus, let's do an exaggerated one, there's plus whatever, around 40 with vibrance and I'll just reset that and there's a plus 40 with saturation and you'll see it's, it's, it's a subtle difference but vibrance is quite nice to add a wee bit of that. We've also got a tonal curve. So those of you used to working with curves, it's just another way of controlling the contrast, the highlights and the shadows in your particular photograph. And basically, how to read a tonal curve, similar to the histogram, but you've got the, the black point is down here, where the dark point meets the dark point, and it's like a graph. If we go up, you'll see, this is referring to our highlights. You can actually see the histogram in behind here as well, um, where this would be your white point, and in the middle would be the middle grays, if you like. The most common curve, is like this. Okay, you take down the low grays and you put up the high grays and you'll see that gentle curve, that S shape. That's a, it's a tonal S curve and it's um, it basically makes the dark grays darker and it makes the light grays lighter so it's enhancing the contrast but we're not going to do that for now. Just Command Z, I'm going to un undo that for now. Quite happy with it, the way I've set it up before, but if you want to use the tonal curve, that's that's it. Um, then you have control here over the color itself. So here, this is this is a brilliant panel because you're able to control HSL, which is the hue, saturation, and the luminance of all of your colors within this within this image. So, for instance. Um, we're looking here at the guild hall. You've got this kind of a, a reddy brown kind of a hue running through it. And I could choose to make my reds. It's quite a, looks like a subtle adjustment there, but I'm gonna change reds and orange so that you can see quite a big difference. I'm gonna make the reds quite pinky and the oranges quite, look. So it makes a huge difference there. In fact, the guild hall's more in the, the orange slider because that was a dramatic difference. But you'll see here, look, it's basically saying with red, orange, yellow, green, aqua, blue, purple, and magenta, um, how orange or yellow do you want to make each one of those? Or the blue, for instance, do you want to make it more towards aqua or more towards a darker blue? Um, and you'll see here, makes a big dramatic difference. And um, the clouds and things, the sky will obviously tend to be in the blues and aquas. So here, look, if I take the blue slider, pull it more towards the kind of aqua green kind of colors, you'll see the sky changes completely. And again, if I push it back towards the bluer end and up towards the purple end, these go in order, you know, aqua, blue, purple. So if I push the blues towards purple, then you'll see it gets that purpley kind of tinge to the, the sky. So it just gives you a lot of control over each wee individual. Again, you probably won't be doing any extremes on this. I'd be very surprised if you wanted, you know, um, like, like these kind of adjustments because it just, you know, that doesn't look realistic, it doesn't look real, but I mean, again, Everyone has their own style, so it might be the thing you're doing. But for me, I tend to just say, ah, oh, let's make the blues a little more, you know, like that or something. And that's like a minus six adjustment. Oranges with the guild hall, you know, you could make it just slightly, there's a minus 10 or a plus seven or a plus five. Little subtle adjustments to that. And it just allows you to control every little individual color within here. So it's, it's really good to do that. You've also got saturation. If I click on here, now this is a really handy trick for anybody that's looking to 
get a quick way to do those kind of you know the kind of color pop kind of images and if I wanted to keep for instance the oranges where we know the guild hall is look if I boost that up you'll see the guild hall is in there and I'm just going to reset that and I'm going to take out desaturate all of the other colors watch what happens when I desaturate the blue the sky turns black and white all right and you can pull out desaturate all of these individual channels and you'll end up with just the oranges like that so you've got a bit in the river and you've got a bit in the the building there okay um yeah cool so um, you can also use uh, we'll get the targeted adjustments actually in a wee second but we'll, we'll not do that for now so i'm just going to reset these because that's not what i want to do and the final one of this luminance so that's basically how light or dark okay how light or dark these individual color channels come in so if i wanted you know extreme example the guild hall to be really light the sky to be really dark you know there there you've got it so but again you won't want to do that and um, we'll just make some subtle adjustments we don't even need to brighten the guild hall but for instance if if you did have one side of the guild hall slightly overexposed or something you can pull that down just a touch and it'll bring that in the line for you it's brilliant you've got so many little parameters on here that you're able to control okay it's and you've also got all where you're able to scroll down through and see them all sitting there on the same screen just going to reset luminance because I've reset everything else. Okay. And now, split toning. This is good too because it allows you to add a specific tone to the highlights and shadows of your image. Um, we haven't done anything, any kind of fancy effects on this, but this is one where, for instance, let's say, let's get our highlights. Um, we could say that the highlights in here we want to be let's kind of put like a, a yellow kind of a tint on them maybe somewhere up around up around here and we could do that and we could take this and we could add kind of shadowy blues okay and you'll see here look so you've got hue saturation again same thing do you want it more or less saturated and um, and the idea of split toning is that you're able to uh, adjust the balance do you want it to be a cool blues or warm yellows but you could also depending on your particular thing you're going for i mean you can completely adjust this you could have you know whatever pinks and greens or whatever and um, but yeah that's that's split toning it's can be useful it's it's not something i would use every day but it can be okay for sometimes using that that kind of effect um now detail as well you'll see this this is really good because you're actually able to see the you know that this is like if you have a particularly noisy photo or something like that you're able to see within this window of all of of the little uh details so you're able to check out if you're say your sharpening has been over sharpened it'll be in the center of your image you'll be able to see if it is actually sharpened so here let's add some sharpening okay we've added 76 there and you can see look it shows you in the detail how sharp that's gotten now you never want to over sharpen because it gives you real problems with with noise and grain so you want to be very careful when you are applying sharpening but here for instance you know somewhere up around there you can see the difference really clearly what's happening here if i have that at zero i have that up at 150 it's like two completely different photos so generally somewhere in around the middle you'll get a nice touch of sharpening bring out your edges and not give you too much noise and um, 
you've also got radius, which is which is the width of like does it apply to every individual pixel or groups of pixels or whatever. You've got uh, detail, how much detail it's it's gone into. Masking is a good one as well. Masking is a really really good one because what this will do again if you hold Alt and click on masking. Okay, I pull this up and it'll show me what areas or what specific lines look. If I have it, if I have masking at zero, then it applies the sharpening to the whole image, the whole thing overall. As I pull this up, you'll see, look, it's it leaves out the sky. Anywhere that's in white is being sharpened and anywhere that's in black is being left out. So I don't want to sharpen the clouds. I'm more interested in sharpening the, the architectural features in this particular one. And I'm just dragging the slider up and you'll see that the clouds will remain soft. And now, look at this, 82, a mask of 82. All of a sudden I'm starting to get only the outside lines of, of these images being sharpened of the actual buildings. And if I go right the way up, 100% or 100 on masking, you've got only the very, very tight lines around the, around the edges being sharpened. So that's quite cool. It's quite good to be able to control your sharpening like that. If I put that to, you know, around 70 or something like that, then the effect it'll have, as we move around, the effect it'll have is that it'll sharpen most of the edges and the lines and the architectural features, but it'll leave out larger areas where maybe noise would, would start to affect, um, start to come up really clearly. So masking's great. It's, it's a great sort of first step to avoid really noisy sharpening just to demonstrate. If I was to set the masking at zero and I was to set the sharpening at 100, um, you'll see here that we've actually got loads of noise creeping in here now. Look how in the sky and up here on those features there. Okay, you would never use that adjustment. You would never have plus 150 and zero masking. You just wouldn't have it, but it's just to show you what the noise reduction feature will do. Um, you're able to put that up and it will try to temper the noise that's in there. Okay, A more realistic sharpening will be up around here. And if I don't mask it, you'll see bits of noise creeping in here and you can pull that up Again, control the detail and contrast of that as well. But it sort of smooths out some of the noise and you don't get that sort of fuzziness that, that can be really distracting from a good photograph. Okay, so let me just zoom out again. I'm just going to reset the sharpening properly. Masking, hold Alt and pull that into your outlines. That's cool. Uh, Slight bit of noise reduction, that's fine, that should be okay. Um, you can go right into that if, if, if you need to as well. Now, this is something that we'll always be using, okay? Lens corrections. Lens corrections are um, every lens and every camera that you use, again, it's back to your, your metadata. Um, it will have stored information on the lens, on even the focal length that you shot it at. So if you had an 18 to 55 lens, it will know if you shot that at 35 or you know 18 or whatever. Um, and what this allows you to do is it allows you to make, look, enable profile corrections. And look at the, dis the difference that made, okay? It gets rid of the distortion that's gonna be inherent in your, your lens. It just takes out that distortion. So whether your particular lens um, is, you know, maybe it's, it's got problems with vignetting around the side, maybe it's something to do with, you know, it's, it's, it's warping it a bit or whatever. This takes it out and it's, it does a really good job of it. It's got a massive database of lenses and bodies and combinations of both of those, and it's able to, to correct for those, which is, which is cool. Um, you've also got this one here, remove chromatic aberration. Uh, chromatic aberrations, basically like around the edges of particularly you'll find it around sharp edges um, you'll get a little bit of color fringing so it might be like a little bit of red or a bit of green just there and it it's it's again something that you want to remove from your your image and it's as easy as just click that 
and it'll get rid of that. So we always click those two, remove chromatic aberration and enable profile corrections. And that'll be, look, you'll see even here, look, lens profile, it knows that I shot with that camera, that model, and so on. Now, you've also got further adjustments down here because look, say, say I was, I had enabled the profile correction, right? And it had changed that. That's quite a dramatic change. It's really cool, actually, seeing it, seeing it work. Um, but if I wasn't happy with the amount of distortion, look, I could add more or take it away, you know, like concave or convex, in or out. And it just gives you an extra element of control because sometimes you might have... Um, you might have a building that you're trying to, to keep straight and even when you enable the profile corrections, it'll, it'll still look slightly off. You're able to come in and just adjust it slightly with that distortion control. You've also got um, vignetting control and what a vignette is, it's like, any, it's like a darkened edge around your photo. Now that can be cool, it can be used for artistic effect and it does draw the user's or the viewer's eye into your photograph. Um, but at the same time, you don't want a huge amount of a vignette in, on your, your original image. So you can, you'll see here, if I pull this all the way to the left, the edges get darker. Look at that. And all the way to the right, the edges get lighter. So for instance, some cameras, some, some lens and body combinations will naturally have a bit of a, a dark vignette around the edges. If that happens, you can take this vignette and control. The profile correction does it really well, but if you need to, you can lighten the vignette a wee bit. Um, just going to leave those where they are for now. Um, any questions, remember, put a, a question in the comments and I'll get back to you about those as well. Now, your next panel is transform. This sort of gets back to what I was saying about keeping buildings upright and things. If, if your lens gets a bit of distortion, you'll see here, look, you can transform uh, vertically. And you can transform horizontally. You can skew things left and right. I mean, this is a, this is a, a brilliant feature. Um, you can rotate the image. And like I said at the start, you know, I'm deliberately making a, an extreme example of a lot of these just so that you can see what they're doing. Okay, now, okay, just resetting all of these, setting them to zero and then double clicking them. And um, yeah, so for instance, if we wanted to, you'll see when you touch one of these, you get the grid coming up. And it's just, if you, if you felt that your image was a bit askew or something like that, you can just make subtle horizontal and vertical adjustments. Maybe you want to rotate it slightly. And that would be much more typical of the kind of adjustments that you would do, you know, like a small change here, a small change here, and yeah. Effects, now, post-crop vignetting. Um, this is kind of a, this is a strange thing because you'll see that I've just spoken to you about your camera and your lens creating a vignette that you don't want, but often what you'll end up doing is putting a vignette back in. Um, so, but what it is, is it's a more controlled way of applying the vignette. You know, you can, you can control how light, how dark, how big, how wide, how narrow, um, and just how transparent and all of that, that, that the vignette is. So it's a controlled, uh, post-crop vignette that you're, that you're applying to it. Again, if I pull this to the left or the right, it gets white. To the left, it gets black. I'm going to set this to extreme black so that you can see what we're doing here. And then the midpoint is basically how wide or how narrow your vignette's going to be. If I, you see here, if I pull it all the way here, it's quite narrow. Push it all the way there. It's only on the, on the corners. And then your roundness. Now, do you want it to be very round or do you want it to be very square? Okay, so here's like, like no, basically minus 100 roundness, um, you know, a closed in midpoint and you'll see you get one of these kind of vignettes around it. Quite a classic kind of a feel to it. And then the opposite, if I make a wider midpoint 
and make it quite round and you know like that you get a different kind of feel to it so that's what i was saying about having more control over this vignette setting and um, feather as well you'll notice again we're, we're still using extreme black which i just i just wouldn't use but we're using that for now and um, to show you that we've got feather okay so what the feather does if i take the feather to zero you'll see look it's just a big round circle hard edges on it and the more i feather the edge the more it blends okay and then within that then you have highlights look okay so for instance if i had a dark um let's see a dark narrow i don't know why you'd want to do this but a dark narrow quite round something like that the highlights actually controls anything that is a highlight underneath the vignette so do you want to keep those right so look for instance i can keep bits of the sky while it's still darkens down these bits here okay so let's um <clears throat> reset these in a sec and i'll do a proper one okay so we'll add a slight bit of darkness we will maybe make it like that roundness we'll widen that just a wee bit and touch of a feather something like that and basically these dark edges kind of take away from distractions here and here around the edges and make the viewer look at the the main point of interest there i had spoken as well when we were out and about about um, your composition and getting that right and trying to use you know shapes like there's there's a clear kind of triangle around here sort of frames i was saying about creating frames within your image so it kind of frames up the the guild hall with this leading lines drawing you in look these from here you know it's got a nice nice flow to that kind of that image um but yeah look look out for that and consider your composition while you're out shooting and then it makes this bit a lot easier as well because you're not having to do an awful lot with it um grain now grains like it's <clears throat> when you used to shoot film you know you'd, you'd buy grainy fast film and had a particular look to it some people really really like to add grain gives a kind of a i suppose a fuzzier kind of a retro kind of look to it i don't know if i'm a particular fan of that but you know you can add that in there if you want to and dehaze as well now the dehaze feature has been heavily talked about when um, for removing things like light pollution from night photographs and stuff like that it's really really good um, set up I suppose as a, as a way of if, if you did have a particular look hazy day and um, this is going to try to remove as much of that it kind of kind of adds contrast but it does it in a very clever Adobe way um, we don't need it on this it was a clear sunny day so but but that's that's what it's for and then finally camera calibration you have profile corrections for your individual camera and you can make further adjustments to the the shadows the blues the reds you know rgb so red green blue that's your colors or your shadows do you want them a particular tint and so on so you can set that up you can add a custom setup to that and have it for your own particular camera and that's us that's that's through the the basic kind of adjustments panel so we spoke about the basic adjustments your tonal curve hsl color and black and white i don't think we actually touched on that sorry i think i'm just covering here color you can pick a bit like this you can pick individual colors and you can adjust the hue saturation and luminance of individual colors specific colors you can also click black and white and it will set your photo to a black and white image i showed you earlier over here how we could use a preset lightroom black and white presets and just pick one of those black and white looks or whatever but if you want to set up your own individual one in the develop module you can do this black and white and now remember the guild hall's orange right so if i say i want my oranges to be darker 
Look what happens, the guild hall disappears in the darkness. And if I say I want them to be lighter, it jumps out a bit. So it's individual color channels and you're adjusting each of them to say how bright or how dark do you want them. So if I wanted a moody sky, for instance, I would take the blues down darker. Maybe the aqua's down darker too. Okay, if I wanted a nice bright sky, you could do that, but you lose a lot of detail. So, I, I mean, personally, I'm a fan of the, the moodier skies, but sure, everybody has their own their own thing. Um, yeah, so that's that's how you would do that as well. That's, that's quite a cool one. You've also, at the top of the panel, you'll notice that you've got these specific little tools here. Now, if, if you hover over them as well, it'll, it'll show you. This is your crop overlay, okay? This is a spot removal, so if you have any little uh, dust specks or individual spots or anything that you want to remove. You've got red eye correction. You have a graduated filter, like a virtual graduated filter that you can add. And you have a radial filter, and you've also got the adjustment brush. Okay, so we're going to walk through these as, as we go. Um, crop, it's very, very good. You can go in here, you can adjust, look, you can pull in one of the corners. Okay, if you hold um, shift, it'll keep that in proportion. Okay, so shift and pull in one of the, the corners. You can also choose to crop out just from the side. Um, you know, you can do square crops, you could do all that sort of stuff in here. Um, aspect, you'll see you have custom, but I've also got, if I wanted, look, one by one is a square crop. So if I specifically needed a square crop for something, that's great. You just go aspect one to one and pull that out and it would crop it for you. Just hit enter. Um, angle as well, you can adjust. Look, you can spin that right round if you want. For the landscape photographers out there, if you do have a, a horizon that's slightly off, that's a great way to, to do it because it gives you the guides as you, look, as you pull it round. It shows you, there's your horizon line. I mean, I'm, I'm not too, that one's okay, I suppose. But you just crop it around like that and drag in the corners. And if you move on to any of the other modules or whatever, it'll crop to that. Or you can go back in and just pull that back out or reset the crop. Um, this one, the next one here is your spot removal tool. So if you did have any little, um, little features or anything that you wanted to remove. Basically, you just click on it, um, here for instance, and here you can say you want to cover it with an area from somewhere around here. So just to give you an extreme example, there we go. That would put the guild hall up along there. All right, so you, you obviously wouldn't want that, but it just gives you an idea. Um, <coughs> Command Z to undo. And yeah, so that's your, your spot removal tool. Very, very handy if you do have, if you're a portrait photographer looking to remove spots and blemishes, if you're a landscape photographer with bits of dirt on the sensor, um, all of those kind of things are, are very, very good, very handy to, to have. Um, to remove that, what I just did there, sorry, I, shouldn't have, I should have explained. Um, if I wanted to put a bit of cloud over there or something like that, I could do so, that's fine. And then if I was to click on it, you just hit backspace and it'll disappear if you're not happy with the adjustment. You can also adjust the size of the brush that you're using. So you'll see the little indicator there. Okay, it'll tell you whether you want to do a big spot or just a tiny spot. Um, and then the feather, again, like we said, how feathered the edges are the opacity of the brush as well. And you've also got these two elements here, which are clone and heel. Um, heel is your, your default, whereby Lightroom will copy across a piece from one place to the other, and it'll blend it in, it'll naturally blend it in. Clone is a little heavier. It'll actually take it and just put a direct clone on top. Sometimes that's what you want. Like for instance, if you've got a particularly tricky spot on somebody's face that you're trying to cover, you might want to take a clear patch of skin from somewhere and clone it directly over the spot. But it's entirely up to the way, up to you. Try them both out and see what you prefer. 
I would use both of them quite a lot, um, depending on the job. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, we're back into our, our treatments down here, it's fine. Red eye removal tool. Uh, obviously, with this not being a portrait, we don't need to remove any red eyes, but dead simple, just drag that around the, the eye and it will fix it for you. Okay, so you've also got here, you've got graduated filters. Now, a graduated filter, if I pull this across, and you'll see, okay, I can hold shift while I'm pulling this to keep it straight, or I can just do that free like this. Okay, but for now I'm gonna pull shift, and you can move this up and move the midpoint around, so up or down. And basically what that is, you'll see here, you're able to uh, darken down the exposure or lighten it. Um, so if you wanted to add a heavy vignette just on top and bottom or something, you could do that just by pulling the exposure down. You could up the contrast. You've got all these parameters that you're able to change. Now, it'll show you here as you go across, like the, the main aim for a graduated filter, in my experience, would be the, you know, pulling down a sky or something like that. So if you wanted to darken it down, you could adjust this and yeah, you see it would get very dark there or spread it out a bit so that it's a bit lighter. It's just nice to have a graduated filter that can bring down a sky like that. You'll also see that you can control tint. So for instance, if you had a washed out sky that looked very, very white, you might pull down this graduated filter and tint a little bit of it blue. I'll do that extreme as well so that you see it, but look. So generally, you can make the sky look a lot bluer. And it's just like a virtual, it's uh, those, those of landscape photographers amongst you, um, it's just like a virtual graduated filter for you. Um, and just click on the central kind of node there and click backspace and it'll just delete. Um, yeah, so that's graduated filters. You can use those for all sorts. Um, and then over here, now graduated as you saw was uh, lines, okay? And it's, it's coming down in squares or rectangles, gradually fading across. This is a radial filter that'll do much the same thing, but you'll see it'll do it in a circular fashion. If you hold shift, it'll create a perfect circle. If you leave go of shift, it allows you to create ovals and things like that. So like, for instance, if I wanted to make one here that, okay, that darkened down everything but this, you know, you can adjust the edges. Um, some people will use this almost, I suppose, like a reverse vignette where you're, look, you're, kind of darkening down anything that's outside of there. Um, it, it can be quite handy. Uh, just to, it, I've also, I mean, I've used it before where maybe there's two or three tricky points in an image itself, and I'm just pulling in, look, like a, like a tight little highlight like that, and moving it across to a specific area or something like that. Okay, just backspace to get rid of that as well. But all the same adjustments. Now, 